Hollanders. So uh, thank you, and I want to acknowledge that this is also part of a, a grant that we're working on together, pulling together in shared waters between uh, North West Indian College, Western Washington University, um, and so this is part of that work. And this, these, this talk will be on the road, going up to Huxley um, from four to five today. I also want to acknowledge that we have a Bert, Bert Weber here, Professor Emeritus, who is um, the interim director, I should say the founding fellow uh, of the Salish Sea Studies Institute. Um, and he was instrumental in um, legally changing the name or pushing forward the name um, Puget Sound, Georgia Basin to the Salish Sea. So I want to acknowledge Bert. coming to Northwest Indian College, and I just want to acknowledge that you brought a, a great group of, um, of uh, scholars, and, and um, but also just, uh, just social justice activists. Social justice activists, um, and we want to welcome you um, to our community. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Marco. So I need some help from everyone, otherwise I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. Little blue form is going to be passed around. If you're able to fill one out and you're and you're affiliated with the tribe, please do so. These little forms get us just a little bit more money in our annual budget. It's called a CEU form. It's for community education. And here we're today doing work with community. Um, so we need to collect as many of these as possible. And if I don't say that before Dr. Guillory takes the stage, I'll get in line. <laughs> please, please help me out. The students are passing these out now. Um, and there's pins around as well, so just fill them out, move them to your table, and we'll collect them. Um, because you're <laughs> <laughs> um, And so with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Hillary, and then uh, we'll introduce Jamie and Larry. Thank you. 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 Th
And so they are, um, uh, what would they ask us to continue to do? And maybe more importantly, what would they ask us as humans to stop doing? And, and so those are just really important things that our, our, um, our indigenous people, our ancestors, who, who told us that if you want to, uh, by taking care of our environment, we're taking care of ourselves, because we're all related. And so we're just really very, uh, very honored that, that Larry and Jamie are here. They're taking an uh, interdisciplinary, um, uh, it's uh, based in indigenous uh, worldview, teachings and values, but of course, uh, integrating that with science to help us to do a better job of, again, taking care of our environment, ultimately not only taking care of ourselves, but for the future generations um, who, um, we, we will have the opportunity for indigenous and non-indigenous communities to take care of the sacred land and water that we all collectively share. And so, again, welcome uh, to all of you and look forward to this uh, conversation. So thank you. Uh, before I introduce uh, Larry and Jamie, and the real last, before I introduce the <laughs> Uh, it's been a request that the BS Indian students stand up, uh, bachelor's in Native Environmental Science, and the graduates. Graduates. And the graduates, too. <laughs> them here on this stage. Um, I think this work is really vital, it's really important, and it makes sense that it's coming from where it's coming from. Uh, because as we think about health, the, the metrics that are out there now, the ways that we measure health, are insufficient. They're not thinking about health in a holistic standpoint. They're not thinking about how loss of damage impacts so many other parts of our lives. Um, and through this work, uh, who they're starting to be able to capture that and bring it into a framework that makes that is easily understandable by decision makers um, and resource managers. And I think we all know that that losing access to that resource is more than just losing those plans. It's losing the connection to place. It's losing knowledge transfer. It's losing that ability to practice your inherent rights. And that's a much larger thing than pure health. What does plant protein look like compared to hot dogs, right? Um, it's much, much larger, and they're doing a really beautiful job about thinking about that and trying to get the group to listen and learn from it. Um, and as such, I really um, honor that they're here. They're asked to be on many stages, many times, um, and they're always gracious and they're always accommodating. Um, and so I think it's, it's a great pleasure to have them here today. With that, uh, I'll start with you. Indian tribal community. 
but got bloodlines going a lot of different ways. You know, from, from Skagit to Swinomish to Kikialis to Samish to Sanich to Sanamis First Nation and to the Eastern Mountains, uh, the Wenatchee Band. So I call it being the Heinz 57 of Indian Country <laughs> and part Welsh also in there. I don't know where he come from, but <laughs> apparently from Wales. <laughs> But we're really happy to be here today. We want to thank thank the Lummi community and the Lummi, especially the Lummi elders, for <coughs> welcoming us and allowing us to come here to present our work. Because uh, we don't consider it Swedish work; we consider it Coast Salish work. This is something we believe that all of our tribal groups in this area can relate to, and they can find as some aspects of it helpful in their own community as they begin to go through these processes. Before I go any further, I also want to thank some people who are crucial in my, my education. First, we needed, we needed Jefferson. She was, her first job when she got out of college was in my community at Swinomish. Her job was to keep me out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I think she would verify it that I was a handful. <laughs> And it took, it took me a little while to find that out. But thank you, Winita. Uh, Justin also mentioned on, I sit on the Board of Trustees for Northwest Indian College. I look at that responsibility not as a representative of Swinomish, but as a representative of the tribal communities here. And the very thing that the elders of this community, when I, when I first got selected to sit on the board and talk to the elders here in this community, and I asked them, what do you want me to emphasize? They said, culture, traditions, teachings. This is what we need to get more of. We're spending too much time on academia. But at the same, I think that's a necessary process as we move forward, as we move forward, maybe leaps and bounds there. Also want to thank Marie Eaton, who is here today. She was the dean up at Fairhaven College up in Western when I was there. I graduated from Fairhaven in 97. Just to let you know that our elders told us when we were teenagers that we want you to go to college, get an education. We want you to go see how the enemy works. <laughs> now they think. <laughs> this is really what they call it. And I told the people up in Western and Scotia Valley College that I didn't go to get higher education until I was 40. Why? Because I wanted my primary education. I wanted that to be a solid foundation from our longhouse, from our community, from our fishing hunting community. All the things that we do as tribal people. So what I saw and learned at Western is how to, how to communicate that with the larger world so they could see that we're serious and that we're real. So many times we send our elected leadership out there we need to protect the things that are sacred to us, but they can't explain it. Now they can just say, well, what is sacred? Why is this sacred? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. So we hamper, we hamper our, our staff people, we hamper our leaders, and not being able to find out what that is. So I've taken that as a challenge here. You're working along with Jamie, putting together these indigenous health leaders <coughs> is a way that would give the tribal community an opportunity to voice their concerns, to voice what their priorities are, and to, to do that and to be able to take those concerns and run them up the hill to the, to the scientists. Quite often, even our own scientists in Indian country, they work in a vacuum because we don't know how to control them. But we want to be able to say, here is the questions. We put on the Biden Deloria Symposium here at Northwest Indian College every year. This is the one thing that he told us in Seattle. I'm not going to worry about the tribes in the Northwest, but you still carry, carry out your ceremonies. And I, I thought that was, that was important. But He'd also give us the idea that we, we needed to learn how to communicate with the non-Indians. 
He told the non-Indians and put there about a thousand people in Kane Hall, the University of Washington, come and talk to us when we're developing the research question. That's why you're not finding now what you need to find out. You put these questions out there and you're not finding it. Why? Because you're asking the wrong questions. This is an effort here to be able to get our community together so that we can get the support for the community. Not that it's just the gathering that they forget about when they leave, but they look at it all through the, the higher process. They eagerly wait for the results of the scientific part of it. We've taken this project to three other tribes in the state of Washington, three, four other tribes nationally. We've been to California, we've been to North Carolina, we've been to Alaska, and we've been to the name of you know, <coughs> Saleotu, Saleotu, the nation in Canada, to bring this work. We see it as a work that, when you look at it, it looks very basic, it looks very simple, but a lot of complex thought going in behind it. But we wanted to put out a version out here that allows any other tribes to look at it and they see the value in it, that they can take it and run with it, but they can adapt it to their own community. We all know as tribal people that when we travel to different places, I spent one winter here in the longhouse, Scott Road, and I was told when you go to different longhouses in different communities, you leave your Swedish teachings at home, you do it the way that they do it on Scott Road. And so this is the idea of this project that Jamie took and took really serious. And that's why we kept part of this very basic and very simple. So if the tribes want to be able to adapt it, to go query their own community, that <clears throat> it's an aversion that is there. We did surveys, we've asked questions, we had a ranking system from one to four. But where we differ from non-Indian people is that any time that you mention something to tribal people, it's going to remind them of a story. It's going to remind them of something that has been lost and they haven't forgotten, they haven't thought about in a long time. <clears throat> and then they start telling those stories. That reminds me. Oral history is science. <clears throat> and then we made sure that we had people there taking notes because those were better than the answers of one to four. And it really gave us a deeper understanding of what those concerns are, <clears throat> how we're able to do this. And uh, we could hear our people say, oh, we know what you do. We understand this. It's in the way that we talk. It's the way that we communicate. It's the way that we think. And that way, our community was able to take possession over. They were able to invest themselves into the community to give us good responses. We were in California visiting with the tribe there, the PhD. We had working with us. Says Larry, my job was to introduce the project to these <coughs> to these people. He said you said something different each time that you talked to these people. Why did you do that? <laughs> Scientists want it to be the same. <laughs> I said, these, we just got here yesterday. <laughs> Our relatives here don't know us. They don't know who we are. They don't know if we're honest. They don't know if we're sincere. And we have to convince them in the two minutes that we have to convince them. We're here for the good. We're here to help them find tools which to be able to document their own needs, their own concerns, and their own priorities that we can take, take and develop a research question. And again, as we went forward, this has been 15, 16 years that uh, Jamie and I have been working together on it. A lot of times it was part-time. Just whenever she could catch me, she'd come and encourage me. And I tell you, because I was the only Indian in our planning department for many years, all the staff people come and ask me, what would Swedish think about this? What would Swedish think about this? A lot of them. They just went, took it as far as it was to satisfy their requirements <coughs> to the reporting agency, and it didn't go any further. Jamie took it a step further, and she made she made me extend myself to really think how would Swedish think. Most of you that know me know that I have opinion on just about everything, <laughs> <laughs> but I really have to think in different ways. How would our community? How would our elders? 
look at this, look at our efforts and it would help us. And we think that those elders have helped us along the way, they've provided us of always meeting the right people, finding the, the money when we needed it. And this project is getting a lot of attention nationwide. Even the non unions have started to look at it because they think that they may be able to use it also to find out what are our priorities in those communities. We don't look at we don't look at it in a democratic way. We look at it in a tribal way, in a community way. Is that work together, work by consensus. Maybe the answers are always not going to be, or the directions you're going to get is not always the way that you want, but eventually you've got to come by and support it and, and to go with it. And to realize it's a process. We'll get to all those concerns that work like another. So I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank the cooks for the food. We always got to thank the cooks. <laughs> Dinner, so we don't get to cook, so we don't get to eat. <laughs> but again, as, as you listen to this, pay attention to the idea of using in, in indigenous health and the indicators to explain why natural resources and coast savings assessments is the key. It is the key because uh, we began to realize finding good health within our tribal community. First, it's going to start out with extreme pride in who we are as tribal people. Having a tremendous amount of respect for our ancestors who lived through difficult times and provided a way for their, them and their families. Remember, here in the Northwest, we're extremely wealthy tribes. Probably the most wealthiest tribes in all of North America because we had riches. We had millions and millions of salmon that sustained us. And when you're wealthy, that's when you develop good social, traditional, and spiritual laws, which in order to be able to make sure that our, our communities and our tribal way of life can survive. If you took a query into tribal people in this area, what do you want to do when you want to grow up? We want to be fishermen. We want to be hunters. When I was at Western, they asked me, what do you want to do? What are you going to do when you get out of college? I said, I hope to be a little smarter fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> and they knew that I wasn't going to change because of that education, but we we're going to change. And so, again, I want to hand this off over to Jamie, my co conspirator and all this. Uh, we took a, a, maybe a radical course by taking it to the community level, because it's not the way that's usually done. And it's groundbreaking work. We're lucky that we have leadership at home that allows us to be very creative in the way that we approach our problems. And I'm glad that for the years that we've been together, she's taken the tribal, Swinomish tribal ideas and put them into motion. I just get to see it to each and every one of you. Give me the game.
to outside folks how to think about doing health assessments with tribal communities. Um, so the way that we developed them, um, we started at Swinomish, we did 100 interviews with Swinomish community members asking a whole range of questions, you know, what does health mean to you, how do you define it, um, what does it look like, what, what are your priorities, and as Larry said, a lot of stories came out of those interviews, um, a lot of information that was proprietary and we wanted to keep quiet, and so we really started to think about, well, we can't give these stories away, particularly not to outside decision makers. So how do we create something that explains all of this really important information to people outside the tribe without giving away these stories? And Larry mentioned that we use a scale of one to four. It's a simple like art scale. Um, it doesn't have to be one to four. It can be A, B, C, D. It can be um, descriptive, like very good to very bad. But it's a simple way to quickly give information to outside decision makers about different aspects of health without giving away the stories. And I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. Um, after we found the recurring themes that were the six indigenous health indicators that I'll put up on the screen next, we brought those back to the community and we said, did we hear you correctly? What would you change? And then we started working with other communities in the Coast Salish region, which Larry mentioned, to refine the indicators. And the set is essentially supposed to be something that those communities can take, like Larry mentioned, and re-manipulate and use for themselves in whatever the context is. So, for instance, he mentioned that we worked in Alaska. We developed six indigenous health indicators. They reformatted them to five. When we worked with Tsleil-Waututh, they wanted four. But it's still based on the same information. These are the six health indicators that we use at Swinomish. Um, you'll see that these are what you will not see in traditional definitions of health. Community connection, um, important sharing networks, and the other thing that you'll notice about all of them is there's a deep connection to the natural resources and to the land. Um, education is not about how many grade levels you've gone through or whether you have any letters behind your name. It's the teachings themselves, the elders being able to pass those teachings on, the youth being able to take those teachings up. Um, cultural use of natural resources, respect and stewardship. I remember one of the first things that Larry told me is when he was trying to explain this to me, he said, well, think about it this way. Do you think I could give thanks over a can of Spam? <laughs> okay, I think I'm getting this. Um, and then that sense of place, that very connected place attachment to a particular area uh, for people who have been in an area since time out of, since time out of mind. Uh, and then the practices themselves, being able to go out and hunt and fish and, and collect, which are inherent rights, also connected to self-determination. What an important part of thinking about health is self-determination. Has anyone ever seen that in a health assessment before? I mean, sovereignty is such an important issue for tribes. Why isn't it out there? Um, and then resilience. This is about the seventh generation thinking. Not just are we here now, but Will tribes be able to be able to continue to access these resources in the future? How healthy are they? Um, the issue of sustainability. And then, of course, natural resources security, a very obvious one. Um, not just the quality of the natural resources, but access is a huge issue. Um, and then the safety of those natural resources. I think we can look at the Salish Sea um, and think about, for instance, what happened in Japan and, for instance, vessel traffic and all these other things that are going on not from the tribes, but still impact the tribe's resources. So how does that impact health as well? So these are just a bit going into each of the six to give a bit more description. Um, there's quotes at the top, thinking about what these look like from a lot of the interviews that we've had over the years with all the different communities that we've worked with, just to give you an idea. And I'm hoping Larry will jump in at one point, whatever he feels like he wants to add something to it as well. But the issue of community connection, having a really strong community, someone, a community to be proud of that works together well, each person has a role, whether not, not everyone is a fisher, some people are fish cooks, um, some people are table managers, it just depends on whatever your job is, but being proud of that and having other people support you, and the sharing. I mean, particularly with elders who are no longer able to go out and access the resources themselves, are they still able to get as much of the natural resources that feed the soul that they need? Natural resources security, obviously this is a, a pretty obvious one in terms of thinking about tribal health, but again, access, such a big issue. I mean, even if there are treaty rights to say that, that you can have so much access, if that, if that resource is contaminated, what does that do? What does that do to the health of the people? Cultural 
cultural use and practices. Again, um, the stewardship aspect, giving thanks, the respect, and being able to properly gather. <coughs> the education itself, again, not the Western style of education, but the traditional teachings. Are those intact? Are people able to pass them on? In a lot of our interactions with the anthropological and the historical historians, they encourage us as tribal people to record our history and our oral history before you lose it. And our, our elders to a person said, no, it's not the right way. We've got we to gotta keep the connection between the old people and the young people. If our young people are looking something, do we want them to go to the book or do we want them to go to the elder? And we all know anthropologists made a lot of mistakes in recording a lot of our oral history. So we want to make sure that they get the in-depth part of it. We as speakers in our tribal communities were taught to put things in a general way. Just in a general way, and if, that, if somebody in the audience finds that useful, they come to our house, talk to us privately. That way we can go very deeply into it. So again, we want to encourage the relationship between our old people and the young people. Because that's the old people whose jobs is to look at their young people. Just like you at North Coast City College, you look at your, your students, find out what their aptitudes are, what their skills are, where they need to be. A lot of times we don't recognize ourselves until that we get advice from, from the faculty here or our elders at home. So we want to strengthen that relationship. Again, self-determination, the ability for the tribe to make their own decisions about their own land. And then resilience. <clears throat> Tribes have been here since time of memorial. Adaptation is always occurring. Tribes are not stagnant. Culture is not stagnant. I think that's a common misconception um, if you don't know tribes well. But there's also that seventh generation. If there's so much onslaught, um, from the outside and it's breaking apart tribal communities, can the community come together and keep themselves in the way that they want to be? And one of the things that you'll notice about the six IHIs is that they're all from a positive aspect. We don't want to think about health in this disease standpoint. It's a very Western way of thinking about health, no. Health is health. It's about the whole positive aspect of it. And so that's the way that we think about health when we're trying to do these types of evaluations. So this is the, this is the ideal what steps the community take to get there, and what are their priorities to do it. And it really depends on the context of what you're talking about. I mean, Larry and I have done these type, this type of work with uh, a tribe who wanted to establish a public health department. They wanted to do it their own way. We've done this type of work with folks that wanted to think about climate change, with folks that wanted to think about development projects, the Morgan twinning of the pipelines, um, with folks that were looking at contamination, and what were the first aspects to clean up, how were they impacted. Essentially, the IHIs, when you really boil it down, are meant to be a tool to give the tribes more power in the negotiations, to be sitting at the table more equitably using language that makes sense to the tribes, but that other people can understand with the like art scale. All right, so how do you assess them? There's three different types of metrics in general in the world. So you have your natural metrics. You can count the number of people who may be sick. You have proxy measures. You can use a percentage of something if you can't count actual numbers, or you can use something <laughs> called constructed metrics, which is what we use. Constructed metrics are all over the place. The Dow Jones is a constructed metric. The Apgar scale for newborn babies, it's a constructed metric. Like art scale, you know, how do you feel today on a scale of one to 10? 10 being great, one being very poor. That's a constructed metric. So those are the types of things that we use to be able to explain each of the IHI pieces without having to give away the stories that flow from them as well. And we found that outside decision makers can understand those types of scales, and for them it makes it a lot easier. Um, so what we do is we host workshops. Uh, for instance, at Swinomish right now, we're looking at sea level rise and storm surge and impact on first foods habitats along the coast, and then how those impacts to first foods may then impact community health. So what we do is we hold a series of workshops. We'll have one with the Swinomish Senate, who's the governing council. We'll have one with the fishers. We'll have some with the youth, some with the elders, just groups 
to have people talk about what we're seeing in terms of the scientific data and then how it might impact the community in all of these different IHI scales. So how do we ask the questions? This is a made up question, but it kind of gives you an idea. We use little wireless polling clickers, so they look kind of like this, and PowerPoints. And what's really nice about them is particularly when you're in a small community and you know everyone in the room, and you may not necessarily agree with the person beside you, if they're an elder, you can't contradict them, but you can vote anonymously, and no one will ever know. Um, so you can ask questions like this that actually can get to some really serious matters. And as soon as the polling is done for the question, the answer pops up immediately on the screen in a simple pie chart. And it really gets people talking. And one of the crucial things that made this project so successful in our community that Jamie developed the questions that we're going to ask our focus group. And then she said, these are the questions I want to ask. Uh, do you have any ideas? Are they OK? And what I did was I just wordsmithed it a little bit to put it in the way that our people talk and think and communicate. So when they saw it, they knew exactly what we talked about. We we're talking on their language, not a technical language or a scientific language. And, and again, that, that's when we begin to see that they took ownership of the work that we're doing. They were doing. And there I mentioned when we went to California, and, and we had only been there for a day, and, and we are introducing ourselves to the tribe there. It was the same thing. I mean, it was really important to have tribal liaisons working with us to ensure that whatever we were developing made sense in the way that we were talking about it, and then bringing it out to the community and having them determine whether or not it was accurate and whether or not it would be useful. Because for us, it's not about necessarily what the staff of any tribe want, it's really what the community wants. So this is really trying to get at health priorities from the community point of view. And also steps forward, because what you get out of this information is, a, is a basically a ranking of significance. How bad will the impact be? But you can also weight it, and what you get from that is how what the priorities are in terms of moving forward. So to give an example, um, we did a pilot workshop looking at sea level rise on the western shore of the reservation and talked about how many acres of clam beds we would probably lose by 2100. And we gave this information out to the community. And then we said, well, what do you think about this? How, what, you know, how will this impact different aspects of your health in terms of the IHI? And then how can we potentially move forward? And people got it just like that. I mean, we had fishermen standing up and saying, you know, if the beach can't move forward naturally because there's some big fancy home there that isn't ours, let's buy the land and rip the home out and let the beach progress forward so the clams have a place to live as the tide comes up, if that's possible. These kinds of things, like the, the information was coming from the community. So I wanted to give just a couple of different examples. I, I mentioned this before. When we were in North Carolina, they really wanted to develop a public health program. But they had been fighting with the county for years about what public health meant to them. And so we went in there and all we did, and it was amazing, for three days we just interviewed community members about what health meant to them and what their priorities were and what they wanted to do to move forward. And we gave that information to, the count, to their council and they were, they were amazed. They said, all we've been told is that we have high rates of diabetes and heart disease and we're very unhealthy. That's all the county ever tells us. This is what we need. We need to hear what the priorities and the foundation of our community is. This is how we move forward. Um, with Tsleil-Waututh, uh, the tsleil First Nation is in North Vancouver, BC, and they're directly opposite of where the Kinder Morgan Pipeline will be twinned. And as many of you probably know, they're fighting very heavily against that. And so we went up with them and talked to community members and said, how do you think the twinning of the pipeline will affect the areas that you would harvest but are currently closed from past contamination, knowing how much more difficult it's going to be to bring those areas back and all this increased vessel traffic, how is that going to impact all these different aspects of your life? And then that information was actually used in their assessment that they gave to the National Energy Board, which is the governing body of Canada that makes a decision about whether or not the pipeline will go forward. Um, in Nondalton, in Nondalton, Alaska, they are one of the communities in the Fala area of the proposed pebble mine. So if you haven't heard, pebble mine is the biggest open pit mine in the world. It's still in the proposal stage. It has not been approved. Um, but if it goes forward, it's going to wipe out a vast section of Southeast Peninsula, Alaska. And they're very worried. I mean, this is a very small community. I think there were 103 people living there. Um, you have to fly in on a float plane. It's completely subsistence. If, they, if there is any sort of tailings coming out of that mine, it's going to destroy the entire community's way of life. And they wanted to have a tool to be able to explain that to government agencies and to 
to the mine developers about how the, what those impacts will look like in a way that, that non-tribal people could understand. And they found those scales to be really useful. And then, as I mentioned, at Swinomish, we're looking at climate change. And so we're taking all of these maps and showing what the potential impacts will be and how high the sea will rise, and giving it to the community and saying, well, what do you think? What will the impacts be? Where do we go next? So, I mentioned this as well. I mean, there's all different kinds of things you can do with the IHIs, and really what Larry and I wanted to see is that if communities are interested in using the IHIs, they, do, they tailor them so that they're useful for themselves. You know, some communities might have three, some communities might have seven. We worked with one community uh, in South Puget Sound who wanted seven IHIs. Great. You know, figure out what the pieces look like and how you want to assess them, and we'll help you with that. We're, we just, we want to help. We're, we don't want to be the ones to tell you what to do. So, I'm going to wrap this up, but we very much would love to hear questions, comments, any insights you have about the IHIs. Larry mentioned that we've been working together for almost 16 years, which is true. But we still feel like these are almost in the infancy stage, and they have a lot. If, many, many iterations in front of them of, of where they can go and what they can potentially be used for. Um, I put a couple of different symbols up here. So Swinomish Tribe, we work a lot with USGS. I wanted to give them a shout out because they're the ones that make our maps for us. They're the ones that are doing the, the biophysical science data and we're using that information. But being here and knowing the students that you have at Oakland City College, that's something that I know that a lot of the students could do here as well. Um, and then the other symbol is that we have the River Systems Cooperative. It's a intertribal consortium that takes Soxwell and Swinomish, and they look at a lot of the off-reservation natural resources. Uh, and in the picture uh, in the center is Chairman Cladisby, he's the chairman of the Swinomish tribe, he's also the president of the National Congress of American Indians. I like this picture because he, it shows um, an event that happens every other year on the west side of the reservation, it's beach training, and it's an excellent example of all of the different IHIs. You have all the different generations out on the beach. Maybe not everybody's actually on the beach shading. Some people are cooking. Some people are sitting together telling stories. There are many elders talking to youth. Um, but it is all the different aspects of the IHIs together in one particular activity. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. And this pulls off. This pulls off to our students from the Environmental Science Program here at Northwest Indian College. A lot of what we're doing is trying to get feedback from our community. So we put those concerns, we put those priorities in, in the motion. But it's also a way to bridge that gap between the tribal communities and the scientific community. We at Northwest Indian College, we hope to be able to provide these hard research scientists in the future so we don't have to interpret our tribal culture for our science because they don't get it. It's, it, it's completely different priority ways. And so we know and we understand that as our people start getting education and coming back, they have that intimate and almost, uh, they have the knowledge to be able to go forward. They may not know the answer, but they'll feel if it's right or not dependent on our spirits, dependent on our ancestors here. So we thank the ancestors that were here today with us to help help in us help us in this presentation. We hope that you find this useful in some way or another. And it's just a small example of work that the tribes are going taking on to be able to convince the of the world that they need to change the way that they do things. They come here from Europe and all these other places and they try to recreate the old country. They were not like us where we learned how to. We learned how to flow with nature, not work against it. I always say that maybe we're lazy because that we work with nature. <laughs> but yeah, we want we want time. We want time with the families. We want to be able to make, make living. We can put this on our priority list. Our fishermen can be fishermen. Our clam diggers can be clam diggers. Our hunters can be hunters. And again, we hope that they have their generosity and when they get enough of those resources, they can take and give it to the old people. I usually try to end this presentation with a story. A lot of these tribal people 
will recognize it. But it, it, it's what helps stimulate our work, Jamie and I's work together. We are told by one of the elders to go to Whitby Island to gather mussels. That time of the year to get mussels. First nice day of spring, I like the first day. We went out to Whitby Island, we got mussels, we brought them back, we took them down to the beach, cooked them up, and we sent the word to our community, come and have a feast with us, come and join us. So the community started coming down, eating mussels. So one of our elders was sitting there and really eating these mussels really fast and really quick. And then I'd see her every now and then reaching her purse, grab a pill, pop in the pill. And I asked my friend, what is your mother doing? He said, go ask her. I said, why are you eating so fast? She said, I'm going to get sick here pretty soon. I said, if, you, if, if these muscles are going to make you sick while you're eating it, she says, because my spirit demands it. My spirit demands it. The doctors will tell you that when your body craves something, that means that your body is telling you you're you're deficient in some vitamin or whatever that food provides. For us, it's like that. We're feeding our spirit. We're feeding our spirit. So we may have uh, our scientific people will say, don't, don't eat the clams here because they're toxic. Our people are going to eat it anyway because they're, they're, their spirit demands them. At 30, I didn't understand that. At 50, I began to understand that because my body started clicking. Craving all of the traditional foods, the salmon. We had a galley, we had a death in Swartimish probably 25 years ago, and one of the Lummie elders come by and says, Where's the fish, Larry? They said, Oh, we don't have fish today. What's wrong with you people? What's wrong with you people? Fish is always out of the central part of any feast that you have. So again, I went that, took that to my leader. <coughs> that's when we started hiring fishermen to go out to catch fish and put it in the cold storage so that any time that we had any type of gathering, we, we'd have fish that were available to our community. And you could see that the elders would come from the surrounding communities and they would, they would, they would be just overjoyed at seeing the fish. You have to realize that the fish that's caught in Lummi and the fish that's caught in Fortimish are different. They need to be cooked in different ways. And they'd always ask, who is your fish cook? Who is your fish cook? <coughs> these are things that we're trying, we think that we're trying to preserve that is important to our community because that these traditional foods that we depend on, they provide spiritual strength to us that is not, enables us to go over. It enables us to keep our elders for a long time so that we can continue to pick their minds and their spirits to help us out into the challenges that we meet in life. Strength. Strength. The more educated we get, the more we have to go back to our traditions, the foundation of who we are And this is why we took on this work, because it gives each community that we share it with who decides to use it. It gives them an opportunity to investigate their own foundations and to remind themselves of it. We need to be reminded of these foundations from time to time because we forget. Life takes us off in strange directions and we don't. Sometimes we forget these things and we have to be reminded. So again, this is another way that we can bring oral history into a way that makes it into political and governmental action. And again, the reminding our community that we are strong, that we are strong, and that you have a piece of a puzzle. So all of these students here, we, we convince you to say that when you're coming to Northwest Indian College and studying that this is what the elders of this community have said. Culture needs to be integrated in everything that we offer. But it's only part way. You find rest of those answers, you go home or wherever you come from. And those answers will be there. And those elders would say, oh, oh I see. you're learning. You're learning. I would tell Jamie about the story that, because I'm one of the traditional speakers at home, I was talking 
every time that we had a death in the community, I was talking about this one concept. And then after about 10 years, I realized while I was not in the middle of floor, that I really misunderstood that concept. I got embarrassed, I got almost ashamed. I turned around and I cut it off and I went running back to my seat because I needed to think about that concept because it finally dawned on me what it was. And one of those ladies gathered me, grabbed my arm like that. She says, we knew you were going to get it someday. <laughs> 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 then I realized that they let me make that mistake for 10 years and didn't correct me because they thought that we were working towards it. So this again, can work in two ways. It can work in the tribal traditional way, and it can work into that scientific way. And let's bring them, let's find a way to bring them together, and we'll all find that health that we're looking for. We'll all find that happiness that we do when we're doing things in the way that the spirit intends us to do. Thank you. within the normal range. 
very this Western conventional science. Could you give us, um, and actually everyone here, when they think about their own personal health, uh, some uh, ways of thinking of, of indigenous personal health <coughs> uh, that we should be thinking about as individuals uh, as well as healthcare providers? Do well, infections and extremities. 
He says, can we take your leg the next time we put you on the table? I said, let me talk to my family. And we got our family working on it. We, we brought our medicine men in. He sat there, looked at it for a while. Then he told me, he said, Larry, he said, you're going to be all right as long as you believe in what you have. The spirit that you have that takes care of you, you're going to be all right. He said, but you, gotta, you have to be strong to get you confident. So when they transferred me to Virginia Mason in Seattle due to the hyperbaric unit and the skin draft, they couldn't figure me out because I was positive. I was taking an active, active part in my own healing. I wasn't depending on the doctors to provide that healing for me. They had a thing there called team medicine. I said, I'm going to be part of that team. Mm -hmm. There five doctors that were there. And they said, we knew you were different, but we couldn't figure out why. When I came <coughs> them, they said they were grateful. It, it, it gave them another, another look onto it. Again, this is what we have, the knowledge and the teachings and the ways that we have embedded in our community that we don't talk about much, but it's still there. So we encourage you know, all of our young people to access anything that you have available to you that's, that's going to help you. Sometimes it's just the idea straight from your mind that uh, to be positive that wasn't going to lose that way. Wasn't going to lose that way. Uh, health is so important to us. That's why we, again, we want our, especially our elders, to be healthy because uh, they went through a lot to get to this this stage in their lives, and we need to find out how they did that, how they can live to be upright a real long age that we're not going to accept going before our time. I just got Then there's the natural 
implicit evidence of that to say, what does it mean? Why does it work that way? What is going on? And it fulfills that education. The idea that uh, you can you can do it two ways. I had one non indian worker that worked with us, and she wanted, where do you find honeysuckle at? Ocean spray. Where's ocean spray? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and finally, she pointed it out to me. I said, oh, I remember. And again, that's the difference in terminology. That's the difference in the way of communicating. And, if we, and this is what we're teaching as a colleague. There's a tribal name. There's a nickname, a tribal nickname. There's a scientific name. And then there's a Western nickname that goes along with that. And I guess the very idea of putting your mind into learning about the plants and the medicines and what is good for you and what is bad for you is very well will instigate the healing as you go along. So I think that's it's not just a, I don't think it's just a political tool so that we can spread our influence to these areas in our seated areas, but it's, it has a valid a valid reasoning behind it. And maybe we haven't got that out to the non-union government as we can. So before I break, two quick announcements. Uh, one, for students, uh, Larry and Jim will be available in the Science Student Lounge in Building 16 uh, for our chats, um, if you want to come by and, and say hi. And then second, if you have the energy, um, there's an encore presentation at Huxley at Western at 4 p.m. today. There's a vehicle from the college. Yeah, there's a vehicle from the college going over. Uh, <coughs> 120, Emma can talk about their science department. Yep, free parking. So we move mountains. There's actually free parking at Western. Yeah. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hands up for free parking and also please hands up for Lady Jerry here. Uh, thank you. Thank you.